The ICF Training and Technical Assistance Team is honored to welcome you to this California Community uh, California Housing and Community Development Training Session offered through the Emergency Solution Grants Coronavirus Relief Consulting and Staffing Services Contract. My name is Chris Pitcher from ICF, and I'll be hosting today's session. Today's training session is part of our Racial Equity Series and is entitled uh, Compassionate Accountability. It is my privilege to introduce today's first presenter, Kavita. Go ahead, Kavita. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Chris and Kristen, for having us here today. My name is Kavita Singh Gilchrist. I am um, one of the co founders of Racial Equity Partners, and we're a consulting practice that has been working on advancing racial equity and helping organizations become more anti racist. Um, we do trainings, assessments, strategic planning, action planning, and coaching. And um, we've been very fortunate to have a good run here with our with our team here um, at, at ICF. So thanks for having us. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live in New York City. So that's usually where I'm zooming in from. Um, and most of my, my, my career before this was largely in the K-12 education space where um, there's been so much uh, actually good work and learning um, to break down the biases and the the harm that occurs uh, for our young people at such a young age, um, breaking the school to prison pipeline and all of the work that's gone into figuring out why we have such disparate um, outcomes when it comes to discipline in the K-12 system. So there was a lot um, we were able to bring in under this new umbrella. And so um, love learning from other sectors and bringing that work to bear. And uh, we appreciate being here today. I'm gonna pass it to Sarah. Hi, everybody. Sarah Breyer. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm in Washington, D.C. Um, I run a consulting practice where I center race equity and organizational development and policy analysis. And I come to the work with 30 plus years of criminal legal system transformation um, under my belt, as well as a lot of work when I was an executive director reorganizing my own um, organization to be racially equitable. I'm a Kellogg Fellow, a Racial Healing Kellogg Fellow, and delighted to be an associate with Kavita at Racial Equity Partners. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so we wanna frame the session today. Um, our session titled Compassionate Accountability. So as we continue our work towards equity, racial equity and all, all the other forms of equity that we are striving towards, we want to create more anti-racist organizations. Understanding, and, for, and to do that, understanding power and how we reframe and redefine power dynamics is really at the center of the work. Um, those hierarchies, those are the things that we need to re-examine and figure out new and different ways of working. And so we ground us in this quote from Martin Luther King, who says, power at its best is love, implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. And so we put that there and, you know, you always want to spend a little more time in reflection with anything um, that Dr. King shares, uh, that we share with Dr. King. Um, and really hope that you take this this quote, this message back with you after this session, just to remind you that what we review today shares an important practice that really helps us become more anti-racist. What we're about to learn about today and practice, because we will be doing some role-playing, is the work that helps us become more anti-racist, right? And anti-racism is an active process. We have to take action. And today we're gonna do that kind of work. Um, and, and when we build those inclusive workspaces by taking action, we end up addressing race, ethnicity, disparities, gender, sexuality, all of the identities that continue to be oppressed can hopefully then benefit from the same solutions that we, that we bring to bear. Um, and ultimately resulting in helping folks who don't feel fully included in the organization, who feel that they can't bring their full selves into work, um, hopefully we will result in better places and, and really striving for belonging for everyone in the organization. So this 
this title, Compassion and Accountability, we wanted to, you know, talk about things we can do in our teams today, as well as individuals to both notice more when we or others um, exhibit bias. Just sometimes people don't notice. For others, it seems obvious, and we're all always on a continuum, right? So we want to learn how to notice more um, and, and figure that out together in teams, right? We have to hold ourselves kind of mutually um, 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 accountable to each other as we'll be discussing. So, um, and the thing in the workplace is you need to figure out how to manage through when bias occurs, when some kind of harm occurs, when whatever it might be, something needs to be interrupted. We call it interrupting harm. Um, so we need to figure out how to navigate that proactively so that we can come out on the other end and continue working together, right? One of the biggest reasons we, well, we're, we have a slide about avoiding conflict, so let me not jump ahead on that. Um, so we wanted to break down this definition of these words to just really, you know, language is important and we're always working to understand it. And of course, some words have different meanings. So we always want to ground some definitions. So compassion, in the way we're trying to talk about it today, we like this, this reference to compassion is there's a lot of emotional emotion researchers out there doing a lot of work around how we have to connect the head and heart. And there's often not space for that in the workplace. And we really want to re-enter love and compassion back into the conversation of how we can really reframe our workspaces. And so compassion is defined as the feeling that arises when you're confronted with another suffering and you feel motivated to relieve that suffering, right? So sometimes you think about empathy. And I would have, you know, uh, uh, previously thought, well, that's a very similar term, right? Isn't it? But empathy refers more generally to your ability of taking someone's perspective and maybe feeling the emotions of another, whereas compassion really is when you are kind of creating, there's a desire to help, like a real desire and action, something calling you a little bit more right? You're not just kind of standing back and really maybe feeling the pain from a distance, but you want to help in some way. So then that's compassion, right? And then accountability, this is, well, you know, taking responsibility for our own actions. At the individual level, it's taking responsibility for our own actions, holding yourself accountable, right? And then at the institutional level, it's supporting people to proactively take accountability for themselves, right? Ultimately, we can only hold ourselves accountable. Yes, there are practices you can put in place as an institution, but they tend to be punitive. And so if we can create more environments where we're working together on these things, accountability can be reframed and perhaps not have such a negative um, connotation. So by striving towards some kind of mutual accountability, this definition of compassionate accountability can come to life, right? Helping organizations create a culture of love and respect in which everyone can thrive. Uh, Sarah, you wanna take it from here? Uh, sure. So this is just a quick outline of what we're gonna be covering in our time together today. We're gonna to talk about why it's important to build a culture of inclusion at the organization that you're at, um, how to create belonging as an ally, what you can do individually. Um, we're gonna talk about some methods for compassionate accountability, and then we're gonna actually get into the thick of it and do some role-playing in practice. So um, before we begin, we always like to go through our guidelines for discussion, um, they're really here to help support you to have a constructive dialogue. There's a direct connection between these guidelines and allyship. So how we have these discussions matters. Um, we should be aiming to have conversations where we're not talking at each other, but rather with each other. These guidelines largely came up by um, an educator named Glenn Singleton, who developed these in the early 90s and we always ask folks to commit to them before we do our trainings and they're going to be particularly important today because we're going to be doing these role plays so the first is to expect to experience discomfort 
We know that conversations about race and identity are tough and are gonna make a lot of people feel uncomfortable. It's okay to sit in that discomfort. Um, and also we recognize that when we're in these role plays, there might actually be some additional discomfort, um, but really try to embrace it because that is how we learn and that's how we move forward and, and how we're gonna get to be better allies. We're gonna ask folks to stay engaged and listen for understanding. It's really easy to retreat from feelings that are inevitably uh, invoked that come up when we're talking about race. It's common for folks to go silent or to bury the responses. Um, it's important to remember that none of us chose our race and none of us uh, created the society that we're born into. Um, white folks in particular often feel like they're being blamed. And while white people, uh, really we do need to own, take responsibility for the advantage, advantages that come with whiteness, um, it's not the same as saying that white people are to blame or should feel ashamed. Um, if you're finding that you're having trouble engaging or if you're finding that you're getting into fight or flight mode, um, we ask that you do what you do to recenter yourself, to reground yourself, whether that's actually planting your feet on the ground and feeling feeling the ground beneath your feet or taking a deep breath. Uh, take a moment to do that recentering and then try to come back to the conversation, come back to the activity. We ask that folks uh, speak their truth. Um, we have to practice being honest with our thoughts and feelings and not just say what you think other people want to hear. Um, this is really important as we develop our racial consciousness. Um, and when we talk, it's really important to remember that we're speaking only for ourselves, not for any broader group. Uh, and uh, expect and accept non-closure. We're not going to uh, fix everything in this one training. Um, it's this ongoing work. So it requires ongoing commitment to engaging, listening, and learning. And finally, we ask that folks suspend judgment. This is a form of cultural humility. We ask that folks listen without judging to treat others as you yourself, you yourself would like to be treated. So give others the grace that you would ask others give you. Um, and again, just always return to humility. Uh, that will enable us to have courageous conversations with each other. With that, Kavita, I think I am done with our guidelines. Sorry. Thanks, Sarah. So stepping into our next section, um, we want to spend a couple of minutes on a culture of inclusion. What does this mean, right? Why do we want to talk about a culture of inclusion? Um, why are we striving for this? So this first slide shows you these attributes of uh, this notion of belonging, right? So we work on inclusion. We want to create a culture of inclusion so that the outcome is everyone feels that they actually belong, right? You can be inclusive. You can put some things in place, but depending on um, how, how things are going and what pulse checks you do, people may not feel that they fully belong, right? There's certain, just bringing someone into a meeting isn't enough, right? That's probably a good example, inviting someone to a meeting, but how you see the person, how you connect with that person, whether it's in the meeting or in other forms, how that person gets supported, um, and pride when it comes to belonging, right? How do you recognize folks when achievements are made? How does someone want to be recognized? But being seen, being supported, connected, and, and having pride in the work you do, these are all these attributes that have been researched um, uh, to be the things that folks need to work on in organizations in order to, to get to a true sense of belonging so that folks truly feel welcome and they can be their authentic selves. Um, and so this notion of belonging, the outcome we're seeking, right? When someone feels belonging, then that's this belief and feeling that you won't be humiliated, punished, or whatever it might be, embarrassed for speaking up with your ideas, that you will feel comfortable speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, and mistakes when they're made. Belonging really requires psychological safety. And so those attributes from before all would contribute to creating that psychological safety. Um, so in talking about this culture of inclusion, right, the, the, that accountability and the mutual accountability that we want um, all to be collectively working on, organizations need to commit to inclusion, right? Just really committing to how are we going to be as inclusive as possible? So all managers, 
uh, definitely need to think that through, but certainly us as individuals too. Um, counteracting the different cultures that favor silence and conflict avoidance, right? That's the kind of thing that we're going to work on today. Um, um, keep kind of keeping your head down, something comes up, don't say anything about it. That's what we need to push back on these kinds of um, 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 ways of working. And then normalizing the compassion and active speaking up and calling each other in. Of course, that's what we're focusing on today. Um, it takes a lot of courage and we know that with practice, we can all be better at it. Um, we'd like to put some data on the table just to remind folks that this uh, while every organization is different, um, there are constant surveys uh, going out to, to, to kind of test these, you know, uh, satisfaction in the workplace and that kind of thing. So this is from a survey, just to understand, and this is a 2022 workplace belonging survey. A few thousand people were surveyed and professionals who experience bias are three times as likely to feel disengaged withhold their ideas and look for another job. And we know there's so much information around now around the job market and the ups and downs, and it's a job seekers market, perhaps. It depends on what kind of job you do, <laughs> arguably. Um, but it really does, if, if someone doesn't feel like they belong, they're they're probably always looking at jobs, right? And that's not kind of the, the you're not going to have the, their full full attention and commitment to the role. And the fact that only 45%, so right? So only half of employed Americans feel safe sharing their opinions or thoughts without fear of negative consequences. Um, Sarah and I have done trainings together for some time now. Um, and often when we have these discussions, people talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, being afraid to speak up because of retaliation it's in, in, in almost every environment we walk into which is a pretty strong word in reaction. So we, we need to work against that. Here's another survey. This is 2019 um, about inclusion. 68% said witnessing or experiencing bias had a negative impact on their productivity, right? If just witnessing it, just, just witnessing it. But of course, experiencing it too, it has a real negative impact, right? Almost 83% said that bias they experienced was subtle or indirect. So that noticing is really going to really matters, right? And figuring out how we notice together and that it's okay if someone doesn't notice and maybe they'll learn so the next time they will notice. All these things we have to put. And then 30% reported ignoring bias that they witnessed or experienced, which can't feel good. So what keeps us from speaking up? Why aren't we more active allies? Not recognizing the opportunity, right? The noticing. Um, uncertainty about the best approach. Sometimes we just don't have the words. We don't know. And then the culture of silence and conflict avoidance, which um, I think Sarah and I would both agree has a lot to do with retaliation. There's a real, uh, whether it's perceived or real, if it's real, that's really a horrible condition under which someone must be working. If it's perceived, then you can probably work with that. Um, so now we wanna show a video to help put this a little bit more into context as well. And this video, Sarah, could you just introduce this as I'm pulling it up? Yeah, so this is a, um, actually I can't remember the, the organization that created the, the video, but they talk about, um, how bias is part and parcel of the world that we live in, how difficult it is to notice that bias and how crucial it is to notice that we're gonna be talking more about noticing. Um, and then they give some really practical ways of intervening and what you can do. So they, um, I love this video because they, they're just sort of plain spoken and um, they get to the heart of the matter. Thank you. We all have our biases, the set of assumptions that we make and the things we don't notice about people's race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, appearance, and other traits. They come from the part of our mind that jumps to conclusions that we might not even be aware that we have. I really can't tell you the number of times people assumed I was the receptionist when I was an executive at the company. That kind of bias gets in the way of good collaboration, 
performance, and decision-making. It creates an invisible tax of resentment and frustration. The more frustrated we are, the more silent we are likely to be. And the more silent we are, the less we may be able to do our best work. The good news, though, is bias is not inevitable. So here's how to disrupt bias in three steps. The first step is to create a shared vocabulary. Sometimes bias shows up in big, embarrassing gaffes, but more often it comes out in the little words and phrases we choose, which are packed with assumptions. In meetings especially, these often go unnoticed, or even worse, people notice, but don't know what to say. That's why we recommend coming up with a shared word or phrase that everyone agrees to use to disrupt bias, attitudes, or behaviors. Examples teams are using are bias alert, stoplight, or even throwing up a peace sign. Leaders often ask us to give them the right words, but the best words are the ones your team will actually say, not the ones that leaders impose. So talk to your team. My very favorite is the one that you recommended, Trier, purple flag. When someone says or does something biased, we'll say purple flag, and maybe we'll even wave a purple flag. It's not a red flag, it's a friendly purple flag. It helps us become more aware of our blind spots. Purple flag. Purple flag. Thanks for pointing that out. I've been noticing lately, I use a lot of sight metaphors that often portray disabilities like being visually impaired in negative ways, but I'm committed to doing better and working on it. I am too. Another great shared vocabulary trick is to ask members of your team to respond to bias with an I statement. An I statement invites the other person in to understand things from your perspective rather than calling them out. Like, I don't think you're going to take me seriously when you're calling me honey, or I don't think you meant that the way that it sounded. Usually, when people's biases are pointed out to them clearly and compassionately, they apologize and correct things going forward. Usually, but not always. That brings us to the second step. Create a shared norm for how to respond when your bias is pointed out. When my bias is flagged, I can only be glad that I'm learning something new if I can move past the shame. I hate the idea that I've harmed someone. And when I feel ashamed, I rarely respond well. So it's really helpful to have that shared norm so that I know what to say in those moments. We recommend you start with, thank you for pointing that out. It took courage for that person to disrupt the bias. So it's important to acknowledge that. Then there are two choices on what to say next. One, I get it. Or two, I don't get it. Could you explain more after the meeting? The other day, you and I were recording a podcast, and I said, HR serves three masters, and you waved the purple flag. I knew what I had done wrong. Why was I using a slavery metaphor? We hit pause, I thanked you, and we re-recorded. It was no big deal. The thing I love about the purple flag is how efficient it is. Flagging the bias didn't prevent us from getting the work done. In fact, it helps us work together more honestly. It's even harder when I don't know what I did wrong. Once I asked someone out to lunch, out came the purple flag. I had no idea why. So I was relieved to know what to say next. Thank you for pointing it out, but I don't get it. Could we talk after the meeting? Afterwards, the person reminded me that they were fasting for Ramadan. It instantly made sense to me, and I discovered something that I could be more aware of. But to get to awareness, I had to move through shame. It was hard to say I don't get it. The shared norm helped me listen and learn rather than getting defensive. The fact that there was a norm at all reassured me that other people are making similar kinds of mistakes and that we're all learning together. Disrupting bias may start off feeling uncomfortable, but with time and consistency, we can build the stamina we need to push through it. When it becomes routine for us to notice our biases, all of a sudden, they feel less threatening. It's hard to break bias habits, yet we can change the pattern with consistent effort. We've got to be patient with ourselves and with others. Patient and also persistent. Yeah. Which brings us to our last step. Once a team has come up with a shared vocabulary and agrees on the shared norm for how to respond, the team should commit to disrupting bias at least once in every meeting. If bias isn't flagged in a meeting, it doesn't mean there wasn't any bias. It just means either nobody noticed Just the targets of bias who pointed out. Observers and leaders have got to speak up. We all have a responsibility. By making a practice of disrupting bias quickly and kindly, we prevent it from metastasizing into something worse, like prejudice, bullying, discrimination, or harassment. 
bias disruptors, a shared vocabulary, a shared norm, and a shared commitment ensure that we notice and learn from the mistakes that we are all making so that we can work better together. When we collaborate, we use our full capacity as humans to get more done collectively than we could ever dream of accomplishing as individuals. So let's stop letting bias get in the way. All right, so that's um, one of our new favorite videos because it just kind of clearly and concisely lays out <clears throat> a few strategies you can take back to your teams um, to think about starting to change the way we um, interrupt bias and harm. So we'd like to pause now and have um, a short large group discussion. We do have more after this, maybe pause for about eight minutes. And um, it would be great if folks could um, turn their cameras on, if at all possible, so that we can have a discussion. And um, the questions we're putting out are, <clears throat> um, Sarah, can you drop these in the chat as well? Thank you. Um, the first is, do you feel comfortable speaking up if you see or experience bias um, or something that feels off? If yes, Tell us why. Um, hopefully we can learn from that. Um, and if no, what's holding you back? What holds you back from speaking up? Um, so that's kind of the first part. And the second part is, is what would help to make it easier, which we'll put in the chat. Stop my share. Thank you, Melissa and Anora, for joining us on camera. If anyone else can, we'd love to see you. Um, or you can just speak and unmute yourselves. Um, does anyone have anything they want to share? You feel comfortable speaking up? Hi, Melissa. Hello. Um, I'm in the workplace, so I don't want to take too much time, so I'll just go on ahead and say it real quickly. Um, unfortunately, I did not speak up um, when a colleague um, was talking about one of our um, clients about having um, HIV. And um, that colleague was like, I mean, I don't care what your sexual orientation is, just don't touch me. And unfortunately, I, um, in that moment, I, I almost like, I was like, oh, I was opening my mouth to say something but like I'm four weeks new into this job. So I didn't want to, um, I just didn't want to be um, difficult if that's the term. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how it was for me. Thank you. Ooh, yeah. That's, um, uh, that's really hard that you had the experience of that both yourself and, and the client. Um, and your newness is clear, like, of course, you're the new person in the room. Um, it, it, it's got to be difficult to do. And hopefully, as we go through the exercise, um, we can, because you don't, you, there, you probably didn't have any bystanders too. There may not have been anyone around you. It's just, you, that's a really tough situation. Uh, but hopefully there's some some words and some language out there today that'll um, in, in encourage you to, to speak up next time. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing. Menora? Um, so similarly for myself um, in the workplace, it's a little harder to um, share with people that they may have been biased, but I think that's setting the standard of having the purple flag and having that conversation on the, on the front end is really going to be very helpful. Um, and then personally, you know, in a social situation, I am less, um, uh, I am more apt to let somebody know that what they've said is biased. Um, yeah, I think that because I work in social services, um, we have an insight and we do this work, right? And that not everybody on who isn't doing social services and even in people who are doing social services don't always see their bias as well. So, um, 
Yeah, thank you. It's hard to speak up in the workplace. I mean, this is, this feels very new. I certainly, I, I, I can't say I had a lot of workplace experiences or any, right? Since I, I stopped formally working in organizations maybe eight years ago, everything was before that. That was pre-2015, right? That was pre all of these things that kind of really, well, murders, right? And police violence that put all of this this work a little more front and center um, for organizations, but it's, you can't do it on your own. So those, you know, using, having that word, having some of the structures in place and then time to practice, um, actually practice. You, know, you, you can't build the culture on your own. We can, and yet if you have any space to reserve a little, you know, chunk of the meeting to, to, to do what we're about to do later, you know, and actually like take some practices and have a discussion, you know, how can we hold ourselves accountable here together, to, together and like not to punish anyone, right? We want to remove the, unless there's blatant harm, they're just like, let's, there's, there's probably some clear lines. Um, but that said, you sounds like you have the language, Anora, because you could do it in social settings where you are more comfortable. So perhaps there's like, how do we make ourselves well, or how do we create more comfort among us at work too? Um, Jewel says, if it was a small intimate group I'm familiar with, yep, more likely to speak up. That is probably a shared, uh, shared experience. Um, yeah, if your manager's in the room, your supervisor, depending on your relationship, if you've ever heard them speak up, right? We need some modeling, the hierarchy in the room. As, as Miriam said, sorry, Miriam, I just like, stole your thunder before <laughs> you chatted it anyway, has a big influence on whether you speak up, of course, of course. And that's why we need them to be working on those pirate and by dynamics piece. Um, there's such a hierarchy in organizations that we we need to you know, it's a, like, it doesn't mean someone can't be a supervisor, but we need a lot of work at that management level um, to, to, to create more of an open space. Um, Jewel also shared uh, di being difficult, it's difficult to speak up because of the fear of developing a label. You know, um, Melissa said that too, um, being labeled a difficult employee. And it's like, I guess I would, on that, is it, from a, is that because of a previous experience you've had perhaps at another organization and we're carrying it? Like, you know, Melissa, like if you had that experience at another organization, then we can understand. Maybe in a new space, there might be more space, but you won't know until you see someone else kind of exhibit, step up, speak up. Sarah, go ahead. Well, and also some people are, are more vulnerable than others. And we're going to talk about allyship and why. Um, <laughs> Sometimes that you you may not be able to speak up and um, do so without again as Kavita was talking talking about without some sort of retaliation or without getting some sort of label and having that reflect ill on your progress in, in the in the environment in the, in the organization and so this is where having an ally um, or being an ally uh, and having an ally is really important to creating a workplace culture of inclusion. Well, thanks everyone. It could, well, oh, go ahead, Anora, and then we'll we'll move to the next. Please, I um I want to just speak a little bit to the culture because so we run a um a day center program for homeless folks, and um the culture during the day center is you know we respect diversity and we have a statement in our guidelines that say that everybody is welcome here. So when I do hear language from clients that discriminates or biases that I will right away address, you know, um, because we've created a culture and my boss has created a culture in our center that this is how, this is the expectation and this is how we behave. So that's really great. That's so great. Yeah, yeah. much great. better note to end on. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. But that's that's great because that also shows, you know, some people are like, why do we have to make a statement, you know, or like make a commitment with it? Like one of the first things we advise groups to do is to, to set out a commitment to racial equity and it should be plastered everywhere, right? On your website, on your pamphlets, on you know, at the front door, so that you can point to it, right? Like you did. Um, that's 
wonderful to hear. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move us along and to our next section, creating belonging as an ally. And Sarah, I believe this is yours. Yep. So yeah, so as we've been, um, and Kavita, you're gonna share some slides, right? Uh, there we go. Right, so we're gonna talk about creating belonging as an ally. We're gonna talk about the importance of using our voice, the importance of noticing, and we're gonna talk about some things that we can say um, and how to, how to do that interrupting. So first it bears some definition of what allyship is. Uh, this is a nice one, an active, consistent, and arduous practice of unlearning and reevaluating, in which a person in a position of privilege and power seeks to operate in solidarity with a marginalized group. And I think it's relevant to, to mention here that most of us hold some form of, of privilege. Most of us hold some form of privilege. Um, it may be because of our skin tone, it may be because of our sexual identity, because of our um, ability status, that there's some way in which we hold privilege. Um, and that then requires or gives us the opportunity to be an ally for people who don't hold that privilege. Um, so Audre Lorde said, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it's better to speak. And this is true. We hope that we all can be in work environments where we can speak and not feel, not feel retribution and not be um, harmed because of our words. But that's not always the case. And this is where allyship comes in uh, really importantly. So ally voices can be heard more clearly when a person who is receiving harm complains, their voice is often dismissed and deemed oversensitive, they may, um, may be dismissed because they're, well, you're being self-interested, ally voices, um, often because of the messenger, often it's a, a person of privilege to another person of privilege, so that messenger, that, that can be heard better, um, and then also they just don't seem to be self-interested, it seems more, more um, virtuous, more um, uh, really for the, for the greater good. So it's really, it's really, allyship is really important to create a culture of inclusion. Uh, we can go to the next one. So noticing. So noticing is pretty critical um, if we're gonna be a good ally. So wherever we have privilege is often a place where we have trouble identifying what other people may be experiencing, right? And, um, so the first step is just to notice that where you, where you carry privilege is, are probably places where you're not noticing that other people are experiencing harm. So it's helpful to walk into the room and assume that there probably is some sort of bias or harm happening there and to be on, try to be on high alert to, to recognize it. There are some structural things that you can do. You can make it a habit to ask, what am I missing? Who am I not hearing from? Who isn't at the table? What are the dynamics in the room? What's what be a be a little bit of put put your emotional intelligence on in the forefront and say, what am I missing here? What am I, what am I observing? Right. Um, and then listen when people share with you. So really resist the urge to discount what may seem improbable to you. People are going to be sharing experiences with you. That is a gift when people share what they're experiencing, if they've experienced harm and they share what that is um, and use it as a chance to broaden your horizons and accept and learn and grow from it. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is where the noticing and the, and most people point out is being a good listener. So, don't, um, uh, often there could be like an 80, 20 rule. Listen 80% of the time, maybe talk 20% if that, think twice before you talk and really just absorb and try to understand. Um, so once you notice something or if someone points out something, then you have to make it a habit to say something and you've got to really, uh, you've got to habitualize it. 
is uh, I, I really love that thing in the, the point in the video where I say we just make it a habit in every meeting, we're going to point out some bias because it is happening. Bias happens all around us. It's You can't help but have it happen. So the trick is how do we interrupt it on the regular? Um, I think we can go to the, the, the that one minute of Francesca Ramsey. So she is one of our favorite educators uh, on YouTube. She's from, she does these series on MTV um, and she really incorporates a lot of humor, which I find um, helps me integrate the message a little bit better. But she talks about the importance of noticing here. Here are my five tips for being a good ally. Understand your privilege. Now, a lot of people get hung up on the word privilege, so let me break it down for you nice and easy. Privilege does not mean that you are rich, that you've had an easy life, that everything's been handed to you and you've never had to struggle or work hard. All it means is that there are some things in life that you will not experience or ever have to think about just because of who you are. It's kind of like those horses that have those blinders on. They can see just fine. There's just a whole bunch of stuff on the side that they don't even know exists. So for example, there are currently 29 states where you can legally be fired for being gay. And there are 34 states where you can legally be fired for being trans. Now as a straight cis woman, those are things that I don't have to ever think about if I don't want to. I'm not gonna be fired because I'm straight and I'm not gonna be fired because I'm cis. So it makes sense that before I can fight for the rights of others, I have to understand what rights I have and others don't. That's privilege. Listen and do your homework. It's Thanks, Kavita. So we're gonna um, just quickly review a few pointers around language that we can use uh, to interrupt harm. And then we're gonna move into our role plays, which is where the fun happens. Um, so uh, one thing to, to note is that so we're gonna talk about how do you call in, how do you have compassion accountability uh, when you're the bystander, when you're an ally. And one thing I like to say is that sometimes people have trouble, you know, finding their voice. They don't want to say, um, we can, again, we can anticipate that harms will occur. They happen every day. They happen in all venues. Um, so one thing is to not just notice, but you can anticipate this happening. You can practice in advance, even if it's in your head. Imagine the scenario run it through in your head, imagine all the caveats, imagine your, where you're going to be sitting, where you're going to be standing, and practice it in your head so that you can, when the moment comes, you're ready. You already have the words handy. Um, you don't need to get caught flat-footed. So one, be an ally, uh, speak up, the person receiving the insult or harm, um, again, their voice may be dismissed. Um, important to speak for yourself, not on behalf of the person who was targeted, who was harmed, so you can say, Jen, that didn't feel right. Here's why I was hurt by what you said. Um, another thing to note here is to not necessarily jump in and be the savior. If the person who is harmed is in the room, you can also check in with the person who is harmed. Say, hey, do you mind if I step in here and say something about what just happened? And the person who is harmed might say, no, I got this. I'm good. Or they might say, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. So that you don't, you don't want to necessarily sort of uh, disempower people who feel like, hey, no, I'm good, I'm good, I can do this. Um, the person asserts they didn't mean it that way. This goes to this question of intent and impact. You know, you can compassionately call folks and hold them accountable. You can't uh, script how they're going to respond. And likely they will be, many of them may get defensive. They're not necessarily going to thank you for that, for that feedback, although it would be nice if they did. Um, but if they do get defensive, and they say, well, I didn't mean for it to happen that way. Um, it's a good opportunity for you to explain there is a difference between what you intended to do and the impact that it had, right? You didn't intend to step on someone's toes, but in fact, it hurt and you wouldn't hesitate to apologize. Uh, so you could say, I appreciate you didn't intend for your words to land that way. Also hope you can appreciate that it still offended me. Are you open to discussing this more another day? The other thing about that last piece around open to discussing it more another day, and they mentioned this in the video, is that frequently when folks are, if we don't, we don't have a culture of being called in, it's something we'd like to create. We don't have a, generally don't have compassion and accountability in our workplaces or in our lives, honestly. Um, 
And when we are told that we did something that hurts them, most people will feel shame. They will feel shame right away and they will go into retreat mode and they won't be able to hear a word you're saying because they just want to assert to themselves and to you that they're really a good person. But no, I'm a good person, really. Trust me, I am, can't you see? So sometimes that conversation where you're trying to help educate people isn't necessarily going to land the best in that moment. You can gauge it, but if you give them a minute and say, can we talk about another day, they may be able to come back and actually have a conversation with you and hear what you're going to say. It depends. You have to read the room, uh, but it does give folks a chance to get over the shame, which can be overwhelming and exceedingly unhelpful. Uh, so calling in when you're the one who's receiving harm, again, um, it's helpful to center yourself, take a deep breath, think about, do I wanna do this now? Do I wanna do this later? Do I wanna do this at all? Am I safe doing this? Do I wanna figure out another way to call somebody in? Do I need to bring in an ally here? But think about your own safety, think about whether it's now or later and how. Uh, but something you could say if you decide that you wanted to do it in the moment and you want to use your voice, uh, it sounded like what you like you just said, insert bias there. Um, is that really what you meant? Is that really what you meant? Or Jen, that didn't feel right. I, I need time right now, but would you be okay talking about tomorrow about what I experienced? Are you open to having a meeting later um, when you've also had time to reflect? Or Mark, I appreciate that you may not have meant it that way. And I hope that you can appreciate that it still landed that way with me. Sometimes you're just not gonna move people. And the most you can do is share and keep on sharing, keep on pointing out and eventually hope that a wedge gets in and they start hearing. I think, Kavita, we go into, we're gonna go into small groups, I think. And then uh, we're gonna come back learn some additional language, but we really want folks to practice because that's where the rubber hits the road and that's where that's where it gets fun. So we're gonna go, I think we're gonna do, I think Chris mentioned that we're gonna go into three rooms. I, I think that's right. Yeah, we have three rooms set up and when you let me know, I can get everyone in there. Awesome. So we've, go ahead Kavita, do you wanna introduce these? Go ahead. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so. Uh, this is the role play, as Sarah said, and there's going to be uh, Chris, Sarah, myself, each one of us will be in each room. And we have these very short scenarios. Uh, I just dropped a document in the chat. And we will also put um, a Google Doc link. Um, and us as facilitators will be in there. They're, they're, um, if for some reason you can't access the document, um, you're not in front of a computer or whatever it might be. Um, so you're going to go in and uh, us as facilitators will be the timekeepers, but essentially we've laid these scenarios out. Um, the facilitator will read it together. This is what the situation is, right? Here's the background. Here's the situation. You're in the meeting and blah, 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 whatever it is. You'll hear that. And then there's a role one and a role two, and you'll volunteer to play one of those roles. Then we'll give you a couple of minutes to read the scenario again. And then Anora, your role one. So you'll be like, okay, I have to say this thing. Maybe I'll say this. You'll think about what you might want to say. Um, and then after you have a couple minutes to think about it, knowing you're in that role, Paul is playing the other role. You have a couple minutes to yourself to think about what might happen. And then Chris or myself or Sarah will say, all right, you all ready to go? We're going to do our thing. And well, I don't know. What do you say? I, I know at the end you say scene. What do you say at the beginning whenever you kick off a, a, a thing? Yeah. Action. Well, action. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe we'll we'll use those. We'll be like action. And then it's literally going to take you no more than two minutes. But the first one is kind of scripted out. Your response isn't, but like what happens is so you can just warm up. And the point is to try to find the words to interrupt the harm that's going on, respond to it, whatever it might be. Um, so we're going to try and get through scenario one and two in the first breakout. Um, and if you find yourself with extra time, run it again with a couple of other people or the same people. You're like, I want another go at it. <laughs> I couldn't find the words the first time. Whatever you want to do, it's all flexible. 
any questions before we go into um, the breakouts? Thank you, Sarah, for sharing. All right, we can open the rooms then. Okay, and I've got everyone on a 10 minute timer in their rooms. Excellent. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Sure. Oh. So I want to add to the list of why it's hard for us to speak up is because we're just really nice people. <laughs> we don't want to. We did. Uh, I had uh, uh, two amazing actors in my room who played played the role out. And when the interrupter did their interrupting, they apologized. <laughs> so because they apologized, not quite problem solved, but it was like, oh, you know, like they felt bad doing it, even though we know we receive that so many times. So um, that was just a, a, a funny moment I wanted to share. But we'd love to hear from other folks how, um, I know there's, and there was a couple of folks in our room who, who can only be on chat um, for various reasons. Um, so that, reminded us that we need to expand this exercise to remember this is a virtual meeting. So you very much have a different way, like you, the power of the chat over having to find your voice is something to be, to, to think through. Like it's often easier. I was just saying until we got jumped back in the room to send an email, right? Excuse me, Chris, there's something I'd like to discuss with you. Uh, you know, it's so much easier to write an email than to call Chris up and say, hey, is there, well, can we talk about something? You know, it's like the written word. It's just, it's easier. It's easier. That's why people are uh, all popping off on social media, right? <laughs> it's so easy to just like, let it, let it, let it go there. So that's an interesting dynamic. We just hadn't um, as fully integrated into this exercise that we should, we should think about. How did it go for you all in your groups? How did, how did for folks who who had to act or got the chance to act had the chance to act? Uh, how did it feel? For our group, we kind of um, ran out of time. We did do one round, and then we were about to attempt the second round, and we ran out of time. Same. We I only got through one round. That was a quick ten minutes. Yeah, that was fast. <laughs> I run it the same amount as a slow 10 minutes. So um, the same amount of time didn't change there. Uh, I think Brandy was speaking. Sorry, Brandy. I was the, let's see, 
if no one else is speaking, I was the designated interrupter um, for the first time through in my group and no one stopped me. And I ran out of script and I just did my best to keep going and got another paragraph into my exciting <laughs> ideas for our city harvest day and then had to pause myself. <laughs> and I could tell I was dominating all the space in the meeting, but hey. Yeah. It did feel sort of powerful, but also deeply self-conscious. Yeah. And we've been in so many rooms where somebody is dominating, right? Not just interrupting, but taking up a lot of a lot of space. And usually there's a lot of bias there around who gets interrupted, right? And who gets listened to, whose who's long-windedness, right, is accepted and and whose long-windedness isn't so it's it's a, and we are and we're, there is this culture of conflict avoidance right so it's both being like nice and nice also uh tends to keep power where it currently sits mm -hmm. And as, as almost always happens when we run this for the first time with a group, um, this often happens that e even if you have, well, actually the script doesn't actually tell you what to say, but it's, you know, we, we try the interrupting one because it's so common and it's, it's across race, ethnicity, and it's often men, it's gendered and, you know, it's just like, it happens so much. And so you think you'd have the words. So part of it, I think half of it is, it's new. We're a new group. We're in the room. Like, oh, I was hoping someone else would speak up, but maybe we just, you know, that is what happens that you just were expecting someone else to do something. Um, often happens. And just, just because we were new to each other, um, as a group facilitator, what is good way to redirect the conversation when one person dominates the space? Well, um, once there's a pause, <laughs> it's always challenging to find the pause. And that takes a lot of practice, especially if there, there isn't one, but it's just trying to like gracefully find that pause and then say, that's a really great, you know, that, 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 however we need to respond to it. Right. I really appreciate what you have to say, Diane. Um, that's a great idea. And can we just go back to Annetta? I, I, I don't think she was finished talking about her service experience. Anetta, did you have more you wanted to say? And then you've given the mic back to the person, particularly in the in the form of interrupting, right? Um, if they weren't interrupting and the person was just kind of going on and on, <laughs> that's a, that's another thing we're always contending with. You can similarly do a, do the same thing: acknowledge what they've said and say that's that's a great idea. Brandy, you know, did you have something you wanted to add? Whether you know, you know. Obviously, if you knew something from before that you'd been talking to Brandy about an idea they had for the service event, then that would be a natural. If you didn't know, you could just be, you just, be, you're, you're passing the mic to someone who, who doesn't usually have it. You can call people in. I always find too, if someone is dominating and, and sometimes folks really talk, um, you have to interrupt uh, and everyone in the room will appreciate it when you do. Um, and the way to do it, I, the, what I, the words I use are, I start off with thank you. I just get it right in there and say, thank you. Those are really great points. Appreciate that. Let's go back. I want to have Annette finish what she was saying too. Um, so you're, you're jumping in with something nice as opposed to stop. <laughs> uh, but you have to, you have to, uh, it, just as a facilitator, you have to keep one person from dominating, it's not fair to the group. Any other takeaways? If we go to the slideshow, right, Kavita? I think so. So we want to share one more piece before we go back in and, and do some more practice. Um, so 
we talked about responding when you're a bystander. And we actually have um, a document we created that has much more detail um, and sample language uh, that we can share with ICF. Uh, these are more the approaches with maybe one example language, but having some language that you can take home with you, um, or sorry, have it work with you can be helpful when you're when you're thinking this through. But we talked about responding when you're a bystander and kind of the ways you can interrupt the harm and why you need to as a bystander. We talked about responding when you are the person who's caused the harm and someone's call, sorry, we, we talked about someone, well, we talked about the second one when you are the person receiving harm and what you may need to do for yourself before responding or if you wanna respond at all. And then this, the third piece is responding when you're called in, right? And as Sarah mentioned, I think right before we broke, um, referencing um, one of the women in the video who talked about shame, right? If someone calls you in, our initial reaction is something like it's telling you you did something wrong, even though they may say it in the nicest language possible. You've been, that's why there's a different way, like the nice language is calling someone in, right? Positive language, constructive language is calling someone in. Calling someone out is, hey, that's not okay. That's not okay for me. I'm going to go take a break. That's calling out. Calling in is, when someone says, I, I, I imagine you didn't mean it that way and yet I'm still offended. And I, I hope we can talk about this later. That's calling someone in and we have to normalize that kind of behavior and language. So how do we, re how do we respond when we are called in? It still doesn't feel so great all the time. So one, try not to be defensive, take a breath. People always, we, we, we just jump to defensiveness Okay. For all the things Sarah already said, I, I'm a good person, really. I really am a good person. So, But now is not, when you are being called in, someone is trying to share their own harm or that someone else is being harmed. So now is not the time to defend yourself. The only thing you should do is apologize. Tell them that you're listening. I have to sit in it. You have to sit in it. Listen to hear what the person who you harmed or the bystander who has experienced the harm as well shares with you about how you've made them feel. You have to just listen and, and resist the urge to defend yourself. You apologize for causing the hurt. Say thank you. Tell them you're going to be doing more reflection. I and then, um, <clears throat> and then actually do the reflection. Reflect on your own, better understand how what you said impacted someone negatively. And I find it's helpful to really, really have a strategy for dealing with that shame because it's real and it is, it is not helpful. Um, and I, I do find that um, it's helpful to have a growth mindset about this work. You are, we, I are going to make mistakes. We're going to say things that hurt people. We don't intend to do it, but we want to be better. We want to be better. We're not going to be, there's no perfect here. We're not going to be right. We're not going to be great out of the box. That's not how it works, right? The only thing we could do is be on a journey of being a better person. And the only way we can be a better person is to get feedback listen to it, integrate it, try to be better the next time. That's right. Okay, so we wanted to go back into the breakouts and do another round of practice. Um, if you didn't get a chance before, um, if you wanna play a different role, uh, you can decide which scenarios you wanna go to. But uh, the, the idea was to try to do two again and, and then go into scenario number three. Right. I will open up those breakout rooms. Thanks, Kristen. Sure. Dropping like flies. They said the word breakout room and one person left right away. Uh, 
So I'm wondering if folks, um, what folks takeaways were from that second round of role plays. I got confused in the beginning. And I read out the um, instructions instead. And then realized after um, my team shared with me that I was supposed to share what the information was about me. Yeah. And then did it, how did it, how did it progress after that? Uh, I think I made, I made the same mistake, see her, so. Did it, were folks, I'm, I'm curious about, sounds like folks probably got through the second scenario. I know our group didn't get through the third. I, I had, um, yeah. someone, was someone else speaking? Um, yeah, I had someone who definitely threw a challenge in the room and I wasn't ready for it. So um, actually, Miriam, that was so good. Actually, I thought I was ready for it and I responded and then they pushed back. Um, in a way that was really good because it was real. Mm -hmm. That's actually, so this was in scenario two and I was in role four, which means I was in the role saying, I don't get the pronouns thing, so I'll pass. And when Gavita stepped in to tell me that to, to establish the norm that the norm that we share pronouns here, my answer was, I strongly prefer not to share my gender at work, because that's an actual thing that has happened in, in my workplace, we have a wide range of genders uh, on our staff, including some people who really prefer to share their pronouns um, as a way, and some people who use they, them pronouns and get a lot out of creating that norm, and some people who don't want to be outed and mm -hmm. don't want to don't want to have to or don't want to have the pressure to share that information in a professional environment. Mm -hmm. And so that's one where I don't really there are ways I have handled it, but there's room for, but I'm sure I'd like to handle it better. Well, I'd love to hear how you did because, and now that you said that and we were having time to talk about it, I'm not sure. I mean, basically what I responded is I said, oh, I said, okay, well, I'd love to be able to talk to you about this um, outside of the meeting. We have an agenda here. We're going to keep going on it, but would it be okay if we can talk about this later together? And she's and they they said yes. And perhaps there was a missed opportunity to recognize something else there in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I again do not have ideas for how to handle this best. What has been happening in practice in my organization is that we start introductions with the expectation that people share pronouns. And then over the course of the introductions, it becomes haphazard. No one comments on whether they're doing it or not. People forget. And so there's enough sort of social sanction that the people who prefer not to just slide in with the people who forgot. And it's not really either clearly establishing the, the expectation that people will share pronouns or clearly establishing it out for people who prefer not to. Right. Yeah, I mean, in a world where there's discrimination uh, against people who are not cisgendered, it's a, it's a really interesting point around making it optional. Well, I, I mean, I think it has to be. I think we haven't necessarily confronted that enough in this because we're often, well, clearly you all are not. I feel like I'm more in spaces where it's a norm to do it. Yeah. Um, and then you, but, and of course, but even in those spaces, we've said it's, it's saying it's optional. Now, in this case, this person said, I don't get the pronouns thing. So the idea was that, is there a moment of education, right? Versus, but then Miriam, you clearly said um, uh, what you said, which is there, and there has to be space for that. Um, wants to... Yeah. Hi, Dan. Hello. So I felt the same way. I uh, let Sarah know that I don't identify. So it, it's not something for me. Yeah. yeah. So how do we create the space where 
we don't you want to push people to explain themselves because whatever they say is also okay. Yeah, I don't mind. I mean, that's your choice if you want to do that. But my choice is I don't want to do that. So yeah. I don't. Yeah. So is it too is it too much to ask to to for someone to uh, then if, if you're not going to just to acknowledge I I prefer not to share my pronouns or I do you do we have to share your preference or is it to Miriam's point those who forget are kind of in the same space with those who prefer not to and even though they're different kind of things right yeah. I guess the, the the note that I would make is Miriam, you you referenced this, you know, you have these experiences, you've had a few different experiences and you don't know what's best. And I think that's where we end. We don't know what's best. This is definitely um, something that we're learning more about. And it probably depends. These are discussions to have with teams, right? Whether you do a purple flag or you can exclude yourself by acknowledging like what those norms are, are probably gonna vary team to team. So there's not necessarily a best, but attempts to keep going forward. What were you gonna say, Miriam? Thank you, um, that makes sense. I think the part here that's really tricky for me is that it can be very hard to tell the difference between someone uncomfortable with a uh, ritual sharing of pronouns because they think that everyone has one of two genders assigned to them at birth which is inviolable and unchangeable and the people who are who have something personal going on that they don't want to bring up in a professional environment and it, it can be hard to sort out the difference at this stage but I think that this is one of the places where people who are likely to cause problems around gender are likely to cause many other problems around gender that can also be flagged and that reluctance to share one's own pro pronouns isn't necessarily uh, a sign of bad things to come. Point taken and lesson learned. Thank you, Miriam um, and Diane for opening up that conversation. We've all learned something today and uh, certainly have some, some work to do there. I think we're at time. Yeah. Yeah. We're generally asking how they react. Yep. Um, thank you so much for a, a wonderful afternoon for, you know, indulging us with, um, with the acting practice um, and Really just appreciate the, the the thoughtful participation, especially when I know you're all still in the workplace and it's often hard to engage. Thank you, Chris and Kristen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kavita. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone, for joining and attending this California Housing and Community Development Training Session offered through the Emergency Solution Grant, Coronavirus Relief Consulting and Staffing Services Contract. Upon your uh, departure from this space, you will see a place for um, uh, for comments uh, and other ideas for sessions, please do use that survey. We really do uh, change our uh, change our um, um, presentations based on your guidance. So please do that, and thank you for attending today. Be well. <laughs>